Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. I'd like to just ask a favor of all the listeners. It would be remarkably helpful if you're watching us on YouTube to press the subscribe button. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, please like us and leave us a review. That'll make a lot of difference to us. Thank you. Well, given that next week is Halloween, we thought we would do our traditional Halloween episode. Uh, Previous topics have included ghosts. I think one year we did horror and another year we did witches. We've probably done, did we do zombies one year maybe? Anyway. I think so. Uh, We're never going to run out of topics, but this Halloween, we thought we would talk about Jung and the paranormal. It turns out that uh, Jung's family was, uh, that the paranormal was very normal for Jung's family, especially on his mother's side. And this really influenced him. It influenced his decision to go into psychiatry. It influenced his thinking. So we're going to talk just a little bit about um, parapsychology and paranormal phenomena, and especially how it relates to Jung and the development of his thinking. So, And uh, before we jump into that, I also wanted to ask people to take a look at our Patreon profile. If you go to our website, thisjunginlife.com, and click on the top under the podcast, you can become our patron. Being a patron is really important. It helps us keep the lights on. Very importantly, it keeps us free of corporate sponsorship. We don't have to read ads on the air if you keep us up and running through a Patreon. And we also have an opportunity to analyze the dreams of patrons. You get a chance to submit them to us. And for instance, uh, when we're done here, We're going to do a special dream analysis for someone who sent us a very spooky and slightly ghoulish Halloween dream, (laughs) and uh, we'll analyze that, and then we post it only for the patrons at the particular levels. So if you come in at $10 a month, we'll have a chance to look at your dream over time, and uh, people tell us it's really special and really meaningful. Mm. So... On to the paranormal. Yes. And, you know, before going further, I should just mention today that uh, Deb wasn't feeling well, so she's taking the week off, but um, she should be back next week. So So, um, what we know about Jung's life is that he was raised in a slightly spooky home, Mm -hmm. that um, the spiritualist movement particularly had taken the United States by storm and was beginning to influence some of the kind of new age spirituality in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. So we know that his grandfather, for instance, had a very vibrant experience of ghosts. Yeah, he, so this is his maternal grandfather. He believed himself to be just kind of surrounded by spirits. And apparently, he would have weekly conversations with his first wife, who was deceased, and even kind of left a chair for her in his study. Absolutely. And then he would have um, Jung's mother stand behind him and bat away ghosts that were trying to distract him when he was writing for his business. So mm-hmm. this, this is a very um, ancient world intruding upon Jung's, in a sense, modern world. You know, in right. ancient times, 
spirits and their influence were just assumed. And people had amulets was, and ways to protect themselves. Yeah. I mean, you know, and in some sense, <clears throat> Jung's family, they were just, they were sort of uh, just Swiss peasants. And these kinds of experiences would have just been kind of taken for granted. Right. So Jung's mother um, had kind of, strange experiences so frequently that she actually kept a diary exclusively to document these. So he's, he's, you know, Jung was born in 1875 and on his father's side, it was his father was a minister and, you know, his grandfather on that side was a minister. He kind of come, he comes from this kind of religious background on his mother's side. There's this long history of, um, mediumship or clairvoyance or, or other such phenomena. And again, it's just kind of taken for granted. But then also, you, you, you know, what's going on in the outer world is a scientific worldview is becoming increasingly the norm. And that's kind of replacing older beliefs. And that's the moment that Jung enters the world. And in some sense, his whole opus is about trying to square these different perspectives. And they immediately in his, in the psyche of this young man kind of present themselves as this core conflict that he feels drawn somehow to address. And, and this leads into his later writings about experiencing himself having two personalities, that one personality being part of this modern world that's familiar with school and family and the culture that he's embedded in. And then he becomes aware of personality number two, that over time he begins to feel is like a monastic uh, 12th century personality mm -hmm. that lives in a world of mysticism and spirituality and, and ancient beliefs. And, and we have a sense of this in the Red Book when he talks about the spirit of the times and the spirit of mm -hmm. the depths, these two mm -hmm. powerful perspectives that speak to each other, sometimes complement each other, but often conflict with each other. And, and one of the important things about Jung is he wasn't willing to just say, well, the, you know, the, the, the personality number two part isn't important, or it doesn't exist, or it doesn't matter, or it's, it's nothing but... You know, he, he's, he's sort of like, there's something there that's important. And then the task, the task becomes translating that into the language of personality number one. And you, you see this in the, in the collected works when you read it. He's always talking about, oh, I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll, he'll often say that. And where he's, he's trying to kind of take these phenomena and explain them in a way that doesn't explain them away, right. if that makes sense. He's not trying to say it's, oh, it doesn't, it's nothing but. But he's trying to c create a frame in which they can be understood. And, and by the way, where he eventually goes with this, of course, is the theory of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. um, and we can probably talk about that in, in a minute. But let's, um, let's, Let's just go right to uh, MDR and, and share some of these stories, if that's okay. Um, and for those who may be new to this, MDR is Memories, oh, Dreams, and Reflections, sorry. which is uh, Jung's uh, autobiography. Yes, sorry about that. Okay, so he's, he's writing uh, about... Um, being a young man. I believe this happened um, maybe after his father had died. Mm -hmm. So he was now kind of the head of the household and he was at this point in life where he was having to make a decision about what career he was going to go into. He says, during the summer holidays, something happened that was destined to influence me profoundly. One day I was sitting in my room studying my textbooks. In the adjoining room, the door to which stood ajar, my mother was knitting. That was our dining room where the round walnut dining room table stood. The table had come from the dowry of my paternal grandmother and was at this time about 70 years old. My mother was sitting by the window about a yard away from the table. My sister was at a 
was at school and our maid was in the kitchen. Suddenly, there sounded a report like a pistol shot. I jumped up and rushed into the room from which the noise of the explosion had come. My mother was sitting flabbergasted in her armchair, the knitting fallen out from her hands. She stammered out, w w what's happened? It was right beside me and stared at the table. Following her eyes, I saw what had happened. The tabletop had split from the rim to beyond the center and not along any joint. The split ran right through the solid wood. I was thunderstruck. How could such a thing happen? A table of solid walnut that had dried out for 70 years. How could it split on a summer day in the relatively high degree of humidity characteristic of our climate? If it had stood next to a heated stove on a cold, dry winter day, then it might have been conceivable. What in the world could have caused such an explosion? There certainly are curious accidents, I thought. My mother nodded darkly. Yes, yes, she said in her number two voice. That means something. Against my will, I was impressed and annoyed with myself for not finding anything to say. Some two weeks later, I came home at six o'clock in the evening and found the household, my mother, my 14-year-old sister, and the maid, in a great state of agitation. About an hour earlier, that there had been another deafening report. This time, it was not the already damaged table. The noise had come from the direction of the sideboard, a heavy piece of furniture dating from the early 19th century. They had already looked all over it but had found no trace of a split. I immediately began examining the sideboard and the entire surrounding area, but just as fruitlessly. Then I began on the interior of the sideboard. In the cupboard containing the bread basket, I found a loaf of bread and beside it, the bread knife. The greater part of the blade had snapped off in several pieces. The handle lay in one corner of the rectangular basket, and in each of the other corners lay a piece of the blade. The knife had been used shortly before at four o'clock tea and afterwards put away. Since then, no one had gone to the sideboard. The next day, I took the shattered knife to one of the best cutlers in the town. He examined the fractures with a magnifying glass and shook his head. This knife is perfectly sound, he said. There is no fault in the steel. Someone must have deliberately broken it piece by piece. It could be done, for instance, by sticking the blade into the crack of the drawer and breaking off a piece at, at a time or else it might have been dropped on stone from a great height. But good steel can't explode. Someone has been pulling your leg. And Young ends the story by saying, I have carefully kept the pieces of the knife to this day. And, and this experience of uh, a kind of explosive event in the psychic atmosphere is something that Jung would continue to experience. Um, he came to call this a catalytic exteriorization experience, that something would be happening in the field of the psyche. In one experience with Freud, when they were um, debating, he had this enormous hot tension that was building in his solar plexus. And at the moment when the energy released, there was a loud cracking noise that came from a bookcase. And then a short time after, he began to feel the tension building again. And he had mentioned to Freud, I can feel this is about to occur a second time. The loud cracking occurred a second time, and Freud was unnerved. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Jung was as well, but his curiosity led him to want to speculate about these things, mm -hmm. uh, led him into a great adventure. So, so, and, and we're right in this area, I think, where we can talk about how these 
occurrence has kind of affected his thinking and his, the development of his career. The the first incident that that I that I read out um, that was decisive for him in choosing to go into the field of psychiatry. So he had been choosing between that and another specialty, and it was partly that experience with the table and the knife that made him decide to go into psychiatry. So it, it was, uh, you know, kind of critical. I also, um, I, you know, he, he, what I read was from Memory Streams Reflections, as we said before, and that was written at the end of his life. So he had the knife at the end of his life, which makes me think that, um, that it must still be in the possession of the young family. Mm. So that would be a fascinating artifact to see someday. Maybe it will come to light. Um, but Joseph, the, you know, the, what you're referencing with Freud, I mean, this is also very interesting. Apparently, in their very first meeting, you know, we, we, we have this great story about him going to, he'd been writing to Freud, and then he goes to Vienna and they, they sort of have this incredible, like, you know, first date where they, <laughs> they talk late into the night. But, but one, of the, one of the first questions that Jung puts to him when they, you know, they, they have lunch together and then they go off into a room and Jung says, I want to know, what do you think of para, paranormal phenomena? And, you know, Freud says, well, it's just ridiculous and, and we're, you know, we're not going to, he, he just sort of denies the whole thing, which, uh, you know, becomes a critical issue for for them, doesn't it? And then there's this, you know, kind of encounter that, that you were talking about where, uh, you know, Jung feels like, no, there's something here and I need you to acknowledge it. That Jung was looking for an explanation, a, a sane, reasonable explanation for himself that didn't, didn't force him to have to split off his lived experience, but a model of psychology that would allow him to accept these strange phenomenon and still include them in a normal sense of self. And for Freud, perhaps dealing with less adaptive personalities, he was more prone to want to analyze, deconstruct, and dismiss what he would have thought as abnormal experiences. I mean, Jung undoubtedly was interested in the reality principle in as much as he wanted people to be adaptive. But he once famously said that the difference between somebody who is, uh, forgive the language, but crazy, and someone who's sane, is that the person who's sane knows when to not disclose their strange experiences. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That a lot of people are having extraordinary experiences, are talking about them, out in the open all the time and being marginalized. And uh, Jung felt, you know, if you had just a little more adaptive persona, you'd actually navigate the outer world with a little more savvy without having to totally deconstruct this magical, mystical dimension of the personality. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that was disappointing, undoubtedly, to Jung, because he was hoping that somebody would help explain these fantastically strange things that were happening or had happened in his family. And, and at that time, you know, both Freud and Jung were looking for the kind of the big ideas, the big theories that were going to explain um, unconscious life. Freud's big idea was the sexual theory. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, that, that kind of the life force, the libido for Freud was sexual energy. And it was what happened to this that really determined uh, what was going on in the unconscious, what was going on in dreams, uh, where there was a blockage of energy or a neurosis. It, it kind of all went down to the sexual theory. And, and Jung, right from the beginning, was not really sure that that was the case. And he was wondering about these other things. And, uh, you know, there, there's this point in Memory Streams Reflections where Jung talks about Freud exhorting Jung to make the sexual theory an unshakable bulwark against the black tide of occultism. So, you know, Freud really wanted this to be a, an explicitly scientific theory. He was going to use this theory of the, the sexual drive and, and its, 
and our relationship with it to explain psychopathology. And he wanted Jung not to be thinking about the parapsychological and to line up behind him in favor of the sexual theory. Yes, I think that, uh, Freud was very much a rationalist in a lot of ways. And in his essay, uh, The Future of an Illusion, where he was talking about religion and religious fantasies as a defense against existential anxiety. So um, he really felt that facing concrete sensate reality and the concrete objects and responsibilities around us, that that constituted healing and wholeness. And anything that seemed to move people away from those very concrete relationships was highly suspicious and had to be kind of analyzed away. Well, for Freud also, that his sense of the non-conscious dimension of human personality was also difficult for Jung to understand. For instance, Jung thought that the ego was the point of consciousness, that it was consciousness itself. But Freud would talk about how the ego would act against its own purposes and not know that it had done it. So the ego defenses, um, let's say like denial, were in a certain way a choice that the ego was making and then forgetting. Like the right hand wouldn't know mm -hmm. what the left hand could do. And Jung said, well, that doesn't really make sense to me, that there has to be a truly unconscious dimension to the personality that has its own personality and its own dimensions. And that also was very different between Freud and Jung, that there was something, mm -hmm. Jung was okay with the uncanny. Yeah. Where Freud seemed to be comforted by believing everything was really knowable and, and mysteries yeah. were just unsolved um, erotic conflicts, which of course sometimes mm -hmm. was true, but wasn't always mm -hmm. true. Yeah, you, you, Jung at some point has this great phrase that I've already kind of alluded to today. He said, why is it when you try to explain something, people think you're trying to explain it away? Uh, and and I, I love that distinction, you know, because I think Jung did want to understand he did want to understand, but he wasn't, he wasn't trying to um, sort of prove that there wasn't something remarkable there, you know. So, so then we get, you know, the theory of synchronicity eventually, which is, you know, kind of magical in a way. But, but uh, you know, he's seeking for understanding without um, asserting a kind of ego dominance. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you're saying, well, look, like you said, Joseph, this is just a, an, un, you know, an, an unresolved sexual tension or something that's manifesting in this way or something. And it's like, it's like the moment in uh, Scooby-Doo when you rip the mask <laughs> off and it's like, oh, it's just the bad guy. There's nothing magical here. Right. You know, we can just reveal that it's some, you know, unresolved sexual tension. Jung is like, no, there's something there to, there's something there, there's something there. It may be unknowable. Uh, but there's 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 something in there. So it's it's this fundamental, and I think this is what you were getting at. It's this fundamental. Um, I want to say like sort of belief in the autonomy of the objective psyche. Right. You know, because because for for Jung, that's where it went to, and there was this tremendous respect for the unconscious. Well, I think that um, for Jung, he saw cosmologies, ancient and modern, as um, kind of artifacts that actually were describing the relationship of the ego to the unconscious, that there was something so far beyond the conscious mind that we were embedded in. He felt very sure that um, the ancient cultures and religions intuited this relationship and found ways to describe it imagistically. But coming back to what you had said about understanding something rather than reducing it or explaining it away, another way I, I would think about it is that Jung was interested in being contactful, that, that he wanted to find a way to contact as much of these mysterious dynamics inside himself, and he understood that the image-making 
function of the human psyche would create a bridge between mm-hmm. his waking mind and whatever this strange and interesting inner world was. And he surmised that, and this was based on many ancient philosophies as well, is that the image that presents to the human psyche has a greater reality, which he called the archetypal world, but a greater mysterious reality that was, uh, in a sense, kind of spiraled backwards from the image. But all we could tolerate, perhaps, or understand is the apparition that those forces present Mm -hmm. to us Mm -hmm. in order to interact, which also suggests, and this is more I was going to say this is more me than Jung, but now that we have the red book, maybe we're on the same page, that yeah. these transpersonal forces or non-personal forces have an interest in us, even as we have yeah. an interest in them. And the collected works, I think he really kept away from that, you know, writing for his fellow clinicians, not wanting to seem too spooky. But then when we have access now to his more private writings, he really had a much more lively experience with these inner worlds. You know, um, I'm listening to what you say, Joseph, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about how this has to do sort of with Jung's whole worldview. I, I like what mm-hmm. you're saying about like seeking contact, because, you know, if you think about it, what, what we've been talking about, about the difference between uh, explaining and explaining away and how, Jung felt about this versus how Freud felt about this. It's a little akin to how they both understood dreams. Oh, okay. Because, you know, Freud to a certain extent did feel like the dream was like the moment in Scooby-Doo where you were up the mask mm-hmm. off. It's like, oh, I've got the code. Now I'm going to tell you what the dream means, right. you know, and that it's sort of like it can, it can be pinned down. It can be um, kind of dissected by consciousness, right. that consciousness can, uh, um, can prevail over the 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 dream sensor mm-hmm. who's trying to hide the meaning and we can sort of be smarter than the unconscious mm-hmm. as it were whereas jung sort of felt like no wait a minute this this intelligence that is present in dreams um is is not being sneaky and actually to follow up on your point kind of has an interest in us and wants to communicate something and we can approach it with a kind of reverence and uh, and and maybe engage with it, and maybe there's something to learn there. But it's, but it, it can never be fully known or fully pinned down. And 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 that where this goes, the further place that this goes, of course, is meaning. I mean, if you're if you're in a world where anything that's a little bit spooky or mysterious just needs to be explained better, then you're really living a kind of sawdust existence where there is no meaning beyond what you see on the surface Mm -hmm. or or if there is it it just requires a um a code break exactly and then you're going to be able to know it in its entirety whereas you know jung said no there's this realm of mystery that is essentially unknowable but we can have a relationship with it and of course, you know, in the first instance, you know, if we live that life too much, we can really feel like there's there's no superordinate meaning. There's there's nothing transpersonal. There's nothing we can't know fully or explain. Whereas in Jung's scenario, we can have a relationship with it with that which is larger than ego, and then suddenly we're living in a meaningful world. Right. And so we could sum the differentiation up between the two as Jung was interested in the encounter and Freud seemed to be used, interested in deciphering. Yeah. And when I think about the spirit of the encountering, that brings me again very much back to Jung's upbringing. That uh, again, in that spiritualist community, that the medium would move into a highly receptive state, which, when we look back now, 
is very much like active imagination, um, mm -hmm. dropping into that liminal state in a state of openness, a kind of beckoning in that particular cosmology, a beckoning for the uh, a spirit of the deceased to come and be in consult, to have an encounter with the medium and perhaps the people in the room. Uh, whether or not we believe in mediumistic work is secondary, but that state of openness, curiosity, a state of respect for what might present itself, and that attitude that the ego is having a, a relationship, an encounter with something that's outside itself. All of those principles that were demonstrated in a way that was very impressive to Jung, I think continued to prepare him to be able to psychologize that in some ways and be mm -hmm. able to, mm -hmm. to instruct other people to go in with a similar spirit. And, and something I th think we brushed against is Jung was, was so interested in this as a phenomenon that he wrote about this as his university uh, doctoral mm -hmm. dissertation, that he had yes. been attending mediumistic sessions that his cousin had been conducting, who was also part of that larger community. And he was so fascinated by the way that her personality would change. And, and how he had described it is his, um, his her waking personality was rather plain and ordinary and not terribly inspired or terribly sophisticated. And then when she would relax into this liminal state, this other personality would come forward that was very sophisticated, very urbane. If I'm remembering this right, might even have spoken more than one language, um, but was just so remarkably different. Mm -hmm. he, he developed a theory of the progressed image of the ego to explain this to himself in one way, that perhaps right. this very sophisticated feminine figure inside of her was prefiguring how this young woman would be, you know, decades forward. But privately, um, and because of his upbringing, there was something more uncanny. And perhaps this other um, female presence had its own independent existence in the unconscious, and perhaps a universal dimension to it. Right. And, and uh, I mean, you know, perhaps we'll talk more about seances and mediumistic activity in a future episode, but, but just sure. to highlight that a bit more. Apparently, he'd been attending the seances with this cousin, who, by the way, was a priest. Friesverk, I'm mm -hmm. not sure how I'm saying, I'm probably saying that wrong. But in other words, it was a, fr a cousin on his mother's side, this, mm -hmm. this family with all of these uh, kind of uh, paranormal things happening all the time. He'd been attending them for a long time and then decided to write about it. But I think in the dissertation, he makes it sound like, oh, I thought I'd study this subjectively. So yes. I started going. So he kind of hides how involved he was in this. But, you know, the interesting thing, Joseph, is he does try to kind of write about it scientifically, mm -hmm. suggesting that this kind of prefigures. But even there, as a young man, you know, he's not dismissing it. Right. He's saying, like, there's something legitimate about what's coming through. It might not actually be a cult. But there's some legitimate thing happening. And, mm -hmm. you know, we understand today that his exploration of his cousin's mediumistic abilities in some way, prefigured his notion of the self, uh -huh. that part of us that knows more, that is greater than ego. So even, you know, he moves it to a kind of psychological register, but, you know, there is something mystical about the idea of the self. So he was always dancing in this place where he's, he's trying to um, deepen understanding of these concepts in a way that doesn't leach out the mystery. Which is a difficult thing to do. And he wants to be in the presence of people that have developed a kind of receptivity to something that they could shift in and out of these ordinary states of consciousness. That that, as it is for most of us, highly compelling. When I think now about this uh, meteoric rise of interest in uh, psilocybin treatments, mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is all pushing into this experience of a non-ordinary dimension 
and that mm -hmm. somehow finding a, a way to encounter these numinous images or experiences can offer us something that has not been appreciated by this very rationalistic model that most of us have kind of lived in. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and we're, we're really hungry for it. And we know there's something to it, right? too. We know there's something to it, you know. You know, um, you were you were talking about the incident that occurred w with him and Freud when Freud was like, nope, nope, there's nothing to it. And then Jung is like, there's this loud crack and then another one that he predicts. And he related that to this rising tension in his body. Right. You know, his first experiences of the paranormal, they started when he was about seven. So it was a period of time when his parents were sleeping apart and there was a lot of tension in the household. And uh, he saw coming from his mother's door a faintly luminous, this is from Memories, Dreams, Reflections, a faintly luminous indefinite figure whose head detached itself from the neck and floated along in front of it in the air like a little moon. So the interesting thing about this is that what was going on in the household, right? His parents must have been going through something really difficult. The, the little boy, Carl, you know, kids can pick that up. And then it manifests, you know, in this in this particular way, just like there was tension in his relationship with Freud, and it kind of has this outer manifestation. So it's like, you know, the interesting thing is something inner, a, a, an emotional state, has this impact on something in the outer world. The other example of that, famous one, which we've mentioned before on the podcast, is what happened after his break with Freud, which was, you know, terribly difficult for him. And uh, he, there was all of this tension in the household. And he, um, uh, f you know, the whole, the whole house could sort of feel it. And then there's this bell starts ringing. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the bell that hangs right inside, it, it has a pull cord on the outside. If you've been to the house, that, that bell is there. It's a big, heavy bell. And it was ringing furiously, and there was no one on the other side of the door. And several people witnessed this. And that, I think, was the same day when there was just this inrushing of Jung, of this kind of energy. And he just sort of uh, just wrote the seven sermons to the dead, you know, which, which I think begins, you know, we are the dead and we have returned from Jerusalem where we found not what we sought. Right. And it's almost like he was just kind of channeling, you know, these these voices, these kind of Gnostic voices. Um, and just to be, to make yeah, it a little more impressive, is that doorbells yeah. back then weren't like the doorbells of today. They were totally mechanical. Yeah. Like you moved a little lever that pulled a string that moved a physical bell yeah. in the home. So it wasn't like a little electrical yeah. short, you know, happening in your, yeah. Uh, yeah. in your modern doorbell. Yeah. Um, but you were talking yeah, about Yeah, I remember when I, when, I, when I toured the house back in 2019, I saw the bell. And I remember I said, we were, we were being a given, given the tour by, I want to say it was, it was some, uh, it was a, a young woman who is of the family. I can't remember now exactly what her, if she was a great granddaughter maybe or something. Anyway, um, and I just looked at the bell. I said, that's the bell. She goes, Oh, you know, the story. I said, yes, of course I know the story. I said, that's a, that's quite a bell. Yeah. You know, it's just imagining that happened. But, but in any case, you know, the interesting thing is, um, and this gets a little bit into ghosts, but, uh, just to revisit this a bit, you know, poltergeist phenomenon, there are some well-documented cases of mm -hmm. poltergeist phenomenon that are not easily explained. Right. Poltergeist phenomenon tends to constellate around adolescent females. So, and it's been hypothesized that this is because, uh, you know, that can be a tremendously tumultuous time in a young person's house. So there's like a lot of sort of psychological tension in the household. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm, I'm trying to pick up this theme that uh, it, there might be a way that psychological life gets exteriorized or kind of catalyzed in these really remarkable ways. And then I'm, I'm going to share a personal story um, that, again, 
shared in an earlier version of the podcast, mm-hmm. but it's worth it's worth sharing. So I must have been about seven or eight, and I had experiences multiple times where I woke up and I saw a man standing over the bed, mm-hmm. and it was a spectral vision. It wasn't like uh, didn't I didn't think there was an intruder. I understood immediately that it was a ghost. It was terrifying. I always stood up, turned on the light, it went away. Um, I, the last, <laughs> I would always call for my mom. and My mom would always say, well, next time, why don't you just ask him what he wants? You know, because my mom was a Jungian at heart, right? Was, and I, I never was brave enough to do that, but I, I love that encounter. that was what she told me to <laughs> yeah, do. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, the last time that it happened, I was a little bit older. It was a Sunday morning. It was, I had just woken up, the blinds were still drawn, but there was light in the room. I could hear my parents in the next room. They were getting ready um, to go to church, I think. And uh, um, I was sitting on my bed awake and he appeared in the doorway, walked over, sat down next to me on the bed. And I, I was sitting like this. Um, for those of you that are only listening, I sort of had, you know, was resting my my cheek on my hand as I sat there and he mirrored me mm. and looked at me and I thought, am I going to ask him what he wants <laughs> or am I going to run? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I chose the latter. <laughs> so then I was talking about this incident with my mom when I was an adult. I think I was probably in my twenties or something. And, um, she said, Oh yeah, one night I woke up and there was a man standing over my bed and I, just looked at him for a little while and then he kind of dematerialized and a moment later I heard you shouting for me saying that there was a man standing over your bed and I was like what you you didn't tell me that you saw the same ghost and she said well you know it was it was really just a psychic you know psychic projection and I was like okay you know whatever you say but but you know the interesting thing is that she was interpreting it very much as Jung might have interpreted it although I I think Jung was a little coy he doesn't he never says he doesn't believe that there could be such a thing as ghosts. And in fact, I, I rather think he did. But at, at least in places, he said, well, this might be like a kind of a manifestation of a psychological phenomenon, uh, kind of an outer manifestation of it. So, I mean, I, I think that's, that's really interesting. Uh, I haven't had many of those experiences in my adult life, although I've had, you know, some that are mm-hmm. difficult to explain. But, um, you know, if we think about the implications of psyche being able to affect the material world in some way, you know, like with the knife, the implications are really interesting. Uh, and, and this leans um, into Jung's much later work with synchronicity and Wolfgang. Exactly. Polly, mm-hmm. that as he's looking at Wolfgang Polly's dreams, and they're also developing something of a collaborative relationship, and Polly was a physicist, that they both get really interested in this relationship between what's happening mathematically and what might be happening um, in terms of this psychological field. And this all funnels to, to a number of points, but one of the things that Jung and Polly both land at is that in terms of the the primal state of the universe there's energy there's matter and there's psyche Mm -hmm. that Jung posits psyche as the third substance out of which the primal universe is constructed Mm-hmm. And from that standpoint, which I think is also rather Vedic, that mm-hmm. that uh, they called yeah. it chitti or mind, universal mind, have, mm-hmm. having been from the beginning, but that this world of psyche lives in an extension from this very subtle, abstract mental possibilities all the way into matter itself. And so when he's writing about UFOs, and he right. talks about the structural UFOs, the, the objects which pilots are observing, which, by the way, has been released by the government now. You can actually see these videos mm-hmm. that the military has released. 
that they actually are true objects because psyche extends into the physical world right. and can affect physical phenomena. Right. So a lot of times when we say that um, it's psyche or it's psychological, people, I think, assume it's some kind of a temporary hallucination that's only that you're happening. you're explaining it away. Explaining it away, or just right. an individual has a funny little glitch mm -hmm. in their brain. But Jung is saying something much more radical. Yes which is that these are objects, and he thought perhaps they were even temporary objects hmm. that would be constellated literally in time and space and might also leave or, or disperse, much like the apparitions that your mother and you were describing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is an actual object. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, it goes, it goes to this notion of kind of the objective psyche, you know, that, that this is... That, that what happens, you know, in the inner world has its own objective reality and, and sometimes manifests in the outer world. Jung was also clearly really interested in kinetic psychic phenomena, hmm. like the cracking of the table, mm -hmm. the breaking of the bread knife, the ringing of the doorbell, mm -hmm. the booming sounds that came out of the bookcase. And in my own... Um, just adventures in alternative spirituality. Um, the, the phenomenologic world, to me, is very involved with uh, kundalini work, mm -hmm. because the idea of kundalini, which is a partly physical, partly biological energy that also has a spiritual dimension to it, which... Um, I know I've said this many times on the podcast, but perhaps for people that are new to it, uh, kundalini means a serpent in Sanskrit. And in many yogic traditions, there's an observation that through various practices, a certain vitality and energy that's coiled in the sacrum can begin to distribute itself through the body and then create extraordinary effects, particularly with consciousness. Mm -hmm. But something that uh, kundalini practitioners have spoken to is that when those intensities get to a certain pitch, strange physical phenomena can happen mm -hmm. uh, in the short term or the long term. So I'd like to tell you a wonderfully spooky story. Okay, great. So this was actually maybe just uh, five years ago. It's not that long ago. I was doing a, a particularly intense uh, cycle of spiritual work and my spiritual work, which involves Kabbalah, also involves a fair amount of work with Kundalini. So there's a lot of kinetic physical stuff as well as uh, chanting and prayer and, and lots of other kinds of mysticism. Are all, all will uh, come together in this container. So I've been doing this pretty rigorously. And I was at the end of the day, and I was just moving some objects that I normally set up in my meditation space. And so there was a votive candle that actually had not been lit. So it was not hot or cooling down. And as I leaned over and just touched the tip of the votive candle, it split in two and mm. fell into halves mm. in a way that was just inexplicable. Hmm. You mean the, so that, the candle, the wax the, split into No, it? the glass the container, glass. Wow. as I just touched it, split in two perfect mm -hmm. halves. Mm -hmm. um, that is not something that happens with any regularity, but <laughs> it reminded me of uh, that just strange and uncanny state that perhaps even the body can get into, mm -hmm. where somehow... Um, strange things can happen, much like Jung having this fire in his abdomen yes. that predicted this explosive sound. So, so here's my question for you about that story, which you had not told me before. Is you know, so this happens with Jung in his conversation with Freud, and by the way, that happened the day that Freud kind of declared that Jung was going to be his heir and his successor. Mm. So it was a tremendously charged time and. You know, you don't you don't have to you know, sort of spill the beans, you know, in a, in a personal way. But it, is there a way that you make meaning out of that experience? Like why that happened then? 
Do you, do you have an understanding of that for yourself? Um, I don't, honestly, uh-huh. because it was, I don't recall it being a particularly emotionally turbulent mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I was doing the spiritual work at a, at a greater intensity than I had at other times. Mm-hmm. And unlike um, Jung, I didn't have some strange internal state, again, beyond the intensities mm-hmm. that I would normally experience right. doing these um, right. kinds of practices. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, um, it was particularly unexpected, particularly strange. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll uh, take a picture of it. I saved it, of course. Oh, and uh, I'll take a picture okay. of it. I'll, uh, we can put it up on Instagram just as a, perfect. a strange occurrence. Perfect, uh, perfect. And I wouldn't be surprised if perhaps um, many of us or many of our listeners have had even just yeah. a single, yes, yes. Uh, totally inexplicable yes. kinetic event mm-hmm. touching something and it breaks. Or um, yeah. another uncanny story I just want to tell that was, yeah, uh, yeah. this is uh, probably 20 years ago when I was doing some consulting work in Maryville, Tennessee, and I had befriended a clinical psychologist who was interested in... Um, the power of visualization. He wasn't, he wasn't terribly mystical, but he was doing some work with anxiety and visualization. So we mm-hmm. became friends and he'd invited me over for dinner uh, with him and his wife. And I was talking about my investigations into Kundalini and this and that. And so everybody's left the room and he kind of leans in and he goes, okay, I'm going to tell you a story that I really would, would never yep. tell. Right. So my son who is just in the middle of, of adolescence, maybe he was 15 years old, he comes in and he's really worried. And he sits down with Richard and he says, Dad, something something's going on that's not right. So Richard kind of leans in and they're alone in the room. And so the boy looks down at this teacup that's on the table and as he's looking at it, the teacup starts to vibrate and violently rock. And you know, he looks at Richard and he's like, something is wrong. And uh, Richard, who was just very salty, he just leaned back and he said, you know, the adolescent brain, who knows? (laughs) And then about six months later, this bizarre kinetic phenomenon just stopped. The kid was never able to do it again. Um, But it was one, just as you were saying, that in these um, rapid, strange hormonal growth periods, neurologic periods, that perhaps the brain, the psyche, many of the things can suddenly yep. and temporarily align to produce, as you were saying, poltergeist activity, which mm-hmm. generally is kinetic. Mm-hmm. It's yes. the door slamming, yep. mm-hmm. the window rattling, mm-hmm. um, object affecting mm-hmm. stuff, not mm-hmm. just um, things appearing telep- and disappearing. telepathy or something. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. So there is something that yeah, that's fascinating. We know anecdotally. You know, there was a period in my life where I made a point of asking everyone, have you ever had an inexplicable experience? And yeah. I will tell you, if you ask people that, just about everyone under the right circumstances will, will say, well, you know, there was this one time when. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe we'll encourage listeners, if you want to um, write it into the comments section on, on this episode, you can share yeah. your own I'm gonna inexplicable. I'm going to make an- Yes, an absolute invitation. Like, okay. come onto our YouTube channel okay. on this episode and just tell. I would love to have a yep. hundred stories of people just telling some crazy thing that happened. You know, candles, glasses splitting, knives breaking, uh, stuff falling off the shelf that you mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. can't explain. Right. That would be so exciting if people yes. would jump on that bandwagon. Yeah. So, so just to talk maybe a little bit about parapsychology, parano- the study of paranormal experience in modern psychology, it is a, it's a bit of a fringe discipline. There are a few universities that have parapsychology departments. I think right now, most of the activity has kind of shifted to Europe, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, you know, there, there's, there have been some experiences, you know, the CIA has been interested in remote viewing and that sort of thing. There's not really good evidence for it, or, or I should say at least maybe that it's controversial. 
One of the experiments that at least for a little while people thought, oh, there's really something here is known as the, I think it's called the Gansfeld experiment or something. You can, you can look that up. It's G-A-N-Z-F-E-L-D. But it, 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 it involves a, a, a receiver being in a kind of light state of um, sensory deprivation. So your, your eyes are covered and you're listening to kind of white noise and earphones. And then there's a sender who is looking at images and trying to kind of convey you the images. And then there's like some kind of rate, you know, so then the receiver will say, here's what I saw in my imagination. And the, then someone will score it and say whether or not it's a hit with what the sender was looking at. So um, there have been, uh, you know, um, Gansfeld experiments that show, you know, it's like um, statistically small, but statistically significant hits um, and then people have looked at that and said, yeah, there was methodological issues with it. So it, they don't really stand right now, as I understand it, as sort of like, it, we can sort of explain it away, if you will. However, I will say that at one point, um, you know, they've looked at people who do better, who are more likely to have hits, have certain personality traits, all of which I have. <laughs> and um at some point I was talking with my daughter about this and she was really interested. I forget, you know, she wasn't, I don't know, maybe she was 10 or 11 or something. And she said, okay, well, let's try it. Let's try it. So, uh, and, and we didn't, you know, set it up, at, you know, under kind of uh, formal uh, experimental conditions. But I think I was, I just started flipping through a book randomly or a magazine or something. And she's, you know, kind of got her, the blanket over her head or something. And, and I was looking at a giraffe, and she said, "I see a giraffe." <laughs> and I was like, "Whoa!" Wow. So wow. you know, and and actually, you know, being being emotionally connected, but an emotional connection between the sender and the receiver is considered to be one of the variables that predicts a higher rate of success. So, you know, who knows? Maybe it was a coincidence, but uh, it was interesting. So. Uh, they're, Definitely they're, gets your attention. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it is super fun to think about all this. And I personally like leaving a little bit of room for mystery in my worldview. I don't, I don't want to turn it all into sawdust or explain it away. And um, mm -hmm. if nothing else, it's fascinating. To me, it's restoring the magical universe. Mm-hmm that um, we, we definitely need to be accommodated to reality, to the limits of reality. Mm -hmm. But we also need to have a feeling that the world around us is magical, mm -hmm. that, that it has a kind of intelligence, and because of that deserves a kind of respect, that there is an integrity in this secret, soulful dimension of the universe. And when we lose touch with that, as human beings, we start acting very oddly in relationship mm -hmm. to the world, to each other, to objects. We can become very dangerous, actually, to each other, to the earth, to the resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we can restore a feeling that the world, the universe, objects have at least a magical dimension, mm -hmm. it brings a feeling quality and a different kind of relationship to, to the phenomenon of the world and a respect, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's lovely, Joseph. I really, really like that. And, and I think the corollary that comes up for me is that voice that says, well, no, that can't be true. It has to be, you know, there has to be a rational explanation. That, n n not, not the sort of genuine urge to understand. I'm talking about, I'm talking about something that feels a little bit more pointed. To me, it smells right. of defense, that we need to defend right. against the possibility that there's something we don't understand. And, and, or can't control. Or can't control. And, and what, if we, what if we approach to that which we don't understand or can't control with a little more curiosity? And if we can get our fear out of the way, maybe even just delight, you know? Yeah. I, I still don't know that I would ask my visitor <laughs> sitting across the bed from me what he wanted, but it's an it's aspirational. Well, 
It's like that moment from the movie Poltergeist. All are welcome. Come into the light. (laughs) (laughs) Bringing them all in, you know. But there's something about that welcoming voice. Maybe maybe someday that'll happen. Right. Well, in any case, we we wish all of our listeners a, a wonderfully spooky, magical, weird Halloween. Indeed. Before we switch to another wonderful, weird, mysterious, magical thing, which is a dream, I'll just uh, invite you all to investigate your dreams further with Dream School. We do not explain them away. We do help you learn to understand your dreams, uh, you know, with appropriate reverence. Um, So we hope that you'll consider joining Dream School. Um, uh, There's a lot of material over there, a really wonderful community, and three live events every month. I do one, Joseph does one, and Deb does one, so you get a chance to kind of hang out with us a little bit. So um, thisunionlife.com, take a look at Dream School. Today's dreamer is a 33-year-old male who is currently unemployed but financially secure. And here's his dream. I'm gathered with friends and family in an outdoor setting at our cottage. Accompanying us is also a handsome fellow with long hair and his sister who I'm hoping to flirt with. We're preparing food for what seems like some festival celebration. My aunt asks me to pass the cake for preparation, to which I sigh and reluctantly bring it to her. I can't help but feel that I'm being selfish, but the truth is I can't wait to get out of there. After bringing the cake, I decide to leave. As I'm passing through the community of cottages set near the lake, I pass by a pack of dogs that are somewhat hyena-dog hybrid-ish in appearance, but they're clearly domesticated and I have no trouble. I make my way to my bed to where I lay down and fall asleep. I open my eyes and it's night, but I can still see clearly. Possibly it's a full moon. In front of me I see a bed, just above the shoreline facing the lake, with the dismembered body of the girl who attended the party. The white sheets are splattered in blood, and only an arm and a leg remain. Instantly I feel an electric rush of fear and terror and shame wash over my body like a tsunami, as I feel I've done this to her. I wake up, holding my dog, curled up in a ball on the bed, still in the dream which is comforting, and then I truly wake. And he notes that two years ago in the same month he had had a similar dream of finding bones dug up at their lake with all the same motions experienced. And for context, he says, I've been going through an extremely difficult period in life in the last couple of years, and I'm just starting to find meaning again thanks to you guys, young and diligently working towards transformation. He says the feelings in the dream were terror, deep shame, and panic, and he adds that he wonders if this is related to uh, a teenage trauma that he had experienced. Yeah, that that happened uh, at at the location of the stream or, or in a kind of similar, similar place. Yes. So there's in both of these dreams, the one, this one, and then the one he says from a couple years ago, there's this moment of a uh, kind of a recognition, you know, that, that something horrible has happened or has, or that he has done and uh, these attendant emotions of terror and shame. So some, there is a sense of something, of a crime that's been committed that, has now, that is mm-hmm. now coming to light. Well, <clears throat> I'm just going to um, pluck out a few elements. Um, so 
they're gathered with friends and family. So we, so for me, that's the setting which suggests, okay, we're working on the family complex. Mm-hmm. It's something to do with the way that the ego experiences the family, what's evoked in it. And he gives us a clue where he's in the family complex and he kind of can't wait to get out of there. Mm-hmm. There's something just really uncomfortable, as it is for many of us when we're young. We're trying to separate out from the family, or perhaps there's just a lot of unfinished childhood tension. So it's difficult. And the problems begin when he decides to leave, which seems really important to me. Mm-hmm. So he's, he's not going to face something in the family, and he's going to kind of separate out. So once he leaves, or in a sense refuses to be conscious, because that's what it means for the ego to leave a relationship with something, it falls out of consciousness. And he's out in the community, and there is a strange instinctive hybrid, which is this dog, hyena, a pack. So we're now in some kind of a, an unusual instinctive part of the psyche, which also has intruded because he's still in the neighborhood, right? He's, he's out of the family cottage, but he's still out and about in the periphery. But um, something to me that seems at least primal and perhaps dangerous, even a pack of wild dogs that had just had used, been domesticated at one point, if they're running around as a pack, um, that would get your attention. Mm-hmm. You know, something's on the loose. Mm-hmm. He says they're clearly domesticated and they don't give him a lot of trouble, but that's the first uncanny yeah. Yep. You're, event. you're right about that. You're right about that. What do you... Yeah, where would you take it after that? So I'm, I'm really curious. I'm not sure what to do with this dream, um, but I'm curious about the aunt, and I'm, I'm a little disappointed we don't have any association because she's sort of the named person in the dream. You know, this is the, the, mm-hmm. the, there's the there's the man with the long hair and his sister, the woman who winds up being murdered. But we don't we don't have a sense that those are real people in waking life. So I'm curious about this aunt. I'm assuming he has an aunt and. Um, mm-hmm. And I would be really interested in the associations. I'm I'm thinking about, you know, the cake. She wants him to pass the cake, and he doesn't want to, but he does. Um, mm-hmm. he, it's like he doesn't want to sort of play ball. But I'm really curious about um, being asked to kind of play this role in this celebration. You know, we need you need to help me with the cake, and it's something he doesn't want to do. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like where you're going with it, that it's kind of an opting out somehow of this family, but exactly how to understand that is a little bit opaque, given that we don't know more, we don't know more about the family, we don't know more about the aunt. Um, I agree with you about the, the hyena, you know, which are particularly sort of, um, frightening. Dangerous. Dog, yeah, yeah. Frightening and dangerous. And they have that sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a terrible, chilling kind of laugh that they make. Um, mm-hmm. And they, they certainly don't belong because unless, we, you know, I, we, I don't have any sense that this, is, that, that this is a place in the world where hyenas occur naturally. So it's really unusual that they, that they would be showing up. Um, and, and then um, he, he, he leaves to go to sleep Right, he lays down and mm-hmm. falls asleep, which goes right. to your point, Joseph, that somehow this is a kind of going unconscious. And then he he wakes up and kind of sees the crime. So somehow, you know, if the dream ego is correct that he's done this somehow, and and I think we could have an interesting conversation about that point, then it mm-hmm. did happen perhaps in between when he left the party confronted the hyena like dogs and and waking up so there there is a way that he uh perhaps was in that hyena like field 
and and something uh, really untoward happened. So as you were talking, I was just thinking about um, the fact that, uh, and this is very abstracting, but he just seems an arm and a leg. There's nothing mm-hmm. else of the yep. body, and then there's a fantasy of, of who this girl may have been, or that, or that it was even a girl. But the act, the only action he took before is, I decide to leave, mm-hmm. and then we discover this dismembered feminine. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if the decision to leave has such uh, evokes such a catastrophic feeling of shame and panic and fear. The decision to not go along with the family expectations. Mm-hmm. And while for some of you that may not seem all that dramatic, but for some people, saying no to the family expectation can feel very frightening. Mm -hmm. almost catastrophic depending on the tension or expectations in the family. So I'm wondering if the the separating out, the saying no to the family expectations has a fragmenting and dismembering effect on the psyche, and that perhaps the instinctive level of the psyche is activating to try to keep him together, to not fragment as he's simply trying to be independent, or that the family itself is perceived as a pack of hyenas. Mm. Perhaps. I mean, I I think uh, there's a couple of other, and we just don't know. We just don't have the data. We don't know. Uh, But, um, you know, the dreamer himself felt like this might be related to a trauma. So let's explore that option Mm -hmm. for a minute, because that is certainly possible that somehow the dismembered feminine might be understood to be uh, like an image of a kind of um, disavowed feeling function, that something's been split Mm -hmm. off, that something's been dissociated, that there, there was something that happened this trauma that he re- recalls from when he was about 12, that somehow it, the results of it haven't been able to be fully felt. So it shows up in the dream as this kind of dissociated image. Um, and, and, you know, that the implication in the dream that the dreamer did it in some sense is accurate. That's an image of the defense that we cut ourselves off from something. So the girl would be this girl that he wants to flirt with, that he wants to kind of get closer to, a desire to perhaps reinvigorate the feeling function. But there are these, there are these emotions that have been split off because they're associated with something that was too big to be metabolized when it happened. So that's another possible way of looking at it. So I'm, I'm going to lean into your... Um your shaping of that. And again, there's something about the pack of hyenas and the dismembered corpse. Mm -hmm. Because um, hyenas would attack something, eat it up, tear it apart. I mean, Mm -hmm. we watch these um, naturalist um, documentaries. It's, you know, it's um, striking to see Mm -hmm. how predators will take down gazelles, etc. So there's, there's the girl, the flirting, the cake I'm leaving, hyenas, and the dismembered girl. So there's, there's something about how to relate to the environment of desire, mm-hmm. the environment of the, of the instinctive um, sexual dynamism. Yep. You know, people, young men flirt because, you know, they have a sexual curiosity and emotional curiosity. Mm-hmm. And something in the flirting, could, could we say the if-then proposition, mm-hmm. that the flirting conjures the pack of hyenas who then dismember the object, the exciting object, because mm-hmm. there's, there's a problem. There's a problem with the ego being in a state of erotic curiosity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's something too, too yeah. primal interferes that, that tears it apart 
squarely in Freud's territory, right? Where the, squarely yeah. in Freud's territory. And, and it's possible, you know, that the, the trauma might have disrupted this young man's ability to feel okay about his sexual desire. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so now any, any kind of sexual tension that comes up, it feels like there's a pack of hyenas inside that's going to dismember someone. And that also right. uh, tracks with his, he mentioned not just terror, he mentioned shame. Right. So right. that, you know, was it somehow shameful to feel desirous? Right. I, I'm still, I'm still also... curious about the cake because I'm not sure what to do with that. But yeah, so we're, we're, we're poking around in the dark here a little bit, but we're just sort of trying on different hypotheses. And this dream was submitted fairly recently. We know, uh, based on uh, some of the more recent surveys, that young men are also extremely anxious yes. about how they can communicate their psychosexual needs in the environment. The fear that if they were to ask, um, this is actually some research I had just come upon, that, um, what is it, 75% of young men are afraid to ask a young woman out for a drink mm -hmm. to meet her because mm -hmm. they fear that it will be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. And 50% of young women say that it would be a form of sexual harassment what? to be asked out face to face to go out for a drink. Oh my God. That the correct way is for the approach to be very slow through some kind of social media, but for a, for a young man to come physically and to make an invitation has now become, uh, is perceived as tremendously transgressive. Oh, wow. So I could also think that there's plenty of young men that are internalizing this feeling that I'd like to flirt with a girl, mm -hmm. but my flirting is now um, characterized as a kind of pack of hyenas that's going to um, cause enormous damage, and, and yeah. he's left with shame and panic, and also with nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. no sense of how to canalize his just natural need to want to flirt mm -hmm. in a party. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's a dream for the collective, perhaps. Perhaps. As, and as, does, as, does uh, where some, say, I know. Right. We're, we're, this is really speculative today because, you of know, it's a, it's a, but, but, you know, but it's valuable, right? To just, you know, what, right. what might you do given that this is the information that you have? Um, recognizing, of course, that we, we don't, we can't pretend to know. But I do want to say that um, when I pick the dreams, you know, I, I, I pick from the top of the pile. So usually the dreams that right. we're hearing have been submitted, you know, a day or two before. And yeah. most of the time they're recent dreams that the dreamer has just had. And, and that actually feels important to me yeah. because, I, you know, it, I, I want... I want our interpretation perhaps to be helpful to someone in their life right now. Uh, and so I'm sort of assuming that this is something that the, uh, the, the dreamer will be hearing shortly after he's had the dream. But I appreciate what you're saying, that it, it might in some way be a dream for, for the collective, or, or at least describing a kind of common scenario now. And I also um, agree that there's something about the ant and the cake and the fact that the cake is implicitly going to be cut into pieces. Mm -hmm. So uh, it may seem very abstract. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. Does the cake become the physical yeah. body? But Eucharistically, there is this strange way that that can happen. And depending on what the cake represents as an extension of the ant, it's complicated. Where the unconscious can make these strange parallels. Yeah. Well, well, what I was to say is, I am, I, I am very unlikely to leave a party as the cake is being served. I, <laughs> I love cake, so I, I have no idea what this dreamer's relationship is with cake, right? But one thing I could imagine is there is a turning away from desire. Yes. It's like, oh, the cake is being prepared. I'm gonna, I want out of here. Mm -hmm. That would that would follow on with this kind of line of thinking that you and I have been exploring, which may not be, may yes, not be close to what's going on, but we're both wondering about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and just to be more optimistic is that dreams are medicinal. And mm -hmm. even though these images uh, can seem right. startling and they're violent or strange, 
the images are trying to angle the dreamer's ego into a position where it can reconsider something, and sometimes the dreams will exaggerate something to get our attention. So from that standpoint, there's flirtation, the enticing deliciousness of the cake, mm -hmm. and then there's uh, the desires turned into a pack of hyenas, and then the desires exaggerated into this carnage. And sometimes something can be escalated to force the ego to pin its attention to the question of, what is this? Um, and sometimes if we have a trauma history, what happens is that the traumatogenic feelings can be added into events that don't deserve them mm -hmm. because they're kind of free-floating. So we're just intending to flirt with someone at a party who you think highly of becomes infused with a level of distress, terror, and shame that the actual moment doesn't deserve. And the dream is perhaps trying to help the dreamer understand the way these various forces um, collide and perhaps is trying to separate them out, just that beginning of the process of things being different and maybe not all needing to be piled into the moment of just wanting to flirt, which is harmless. Mm -hmm. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.